Uh, I guess since y'all are still there, it's it's coming through all right. Uh, I want to start in Romans chapter 11 tonight. I want to talk to you about something that uh, we talk about, I guess, every time we have Bible study. But I want to talk about it kind of in a more specific way uh, than usual tonight. And uh, I want to talk about the... I want to talk about the grace of God, uh, but as I said, I want to talk about it in kind of a different way. Uh, In Romans chapter 11, in verse 1, uh, Paul says there in in verse 1, I say then, hath God cast away his people, God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew, what ye not what saith the scripture, saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, and have digged down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself seven thousand men, who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so, then at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, and it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Now, I want to start there because I want you to understand that in talking about the grace of God, there's people that uh, people have all different kind of ideas about that. And uh, we we put emphasis on the grace of God because we understand that we are living uh, in the dispensation of grace. Now, I know that people say and people uh, argue the point that salvation has always been by grace. Well, I would not deny the fact that God, nobody was ever saved in any dispensation apart from grace. But Paul makes it clear right here He says, if by grace, then it is no more of works. And I always think back to the scripture that says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God was gracious in saving the man Noah. But I also know and understand that had Noah not built an ark, Noah would have drowned. And so just because grace has always been involved in salvation... That does not mean that salvation has been the same all the way through the Bible. There are always two components that were necessary for salvation, grace and faith. But the faith in time past produced works that, uh, in effect, demonstrated their faith. Uh, And the grace had to do with God saving them by faith plus works. That's why Paul says, if by grace, it is no more of works. So you'll find grace mentioned in the Old Testament. You'll find grace mentioned in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But nobody mentions grace more than does the Apostle Paul in the 13 epistles uh, that he wrote. As a matter of fact, he starts out his epistles in Romans chapter 1. and verse 5, he says... I mean, five verses into the first epistle, that is in the order in which they are in your Bible, five verses into the first epistle in your King James Bible that Paul wrote, he says, by whom we have received grace. By whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Uh, I really appreciate the men filling in for me this past Sunday. I was able to get back early enough on Sunday night to hear Brother Charlie Fouché teach at our church. And uh, he does a great job of teaching, and he did a great study on grace and peace. I wish we could have recorded it. Uh, But he, he talked about the grace and peace as set in contrast with wrath and judgment. Well, Paul says, by whom, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, Verse 3, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the son of God, which with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations 
for his name. So I want to talk to you about this grace and particularly the grace as it's presented through our apostle, the apostle Paul. And uh, in looking at that, look over in Romans chapter 3. In Romans chapter 3, in verse 21, Paul said, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now notice the next statement. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Thank God for the fact that it is by His grace that we have redemption through His blood. And He says it's uh, uh, we're justified freely by His grace and it came through, obviously, Christ Jesus. So I want to mention four about four things tonight in relation to the grace of God. Uh, turn first of all over, well, not first of all, turn Second Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And I want you to notice first of all that the grace of God is an abundant grace. It's an abundant grace. Uh, you know, the word abundant means to be present in great quantity. It means, uh, to, it means more than adequate, uh, well supplied, uh, richly supplied. So in thinking about that, look in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and in verse, verse, uh, verse 12, So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We have in the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus, and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Aren't you glad that God's grace is abundant? It's not just limited, it's abundant, and it's made uh, available to all that believe. God, God has extended his grace to mankind through the death of his son. That's why Paul says in Ephesians 3 that we are living in the dispensation of the grace of God. Now, there are people who want to make an issue over whether that's a time period or an administration. Regardless of what you call it, it covers a time period. Because Paul says in Romans chapter 11 that blindness in part is happened to Israel to the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So there's going to come, just like there was a beginning to the dispensation of the grace of God, there's going to be an end to the dispensation of the grace of God. But thankfully that, during, thankfully that during this dispensation, God's grace is just like Paul says here. He said, for all things are for your sake, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. So it's an abundant grace. That word abundant, it has to do with riches. Look over in Ephesians chapter 1. You know, if people have an abundance of money, if they have abundance of wealth, if they have abundance of things, material possessions, we generally consider those people rich or wealthy. Well, notice what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, in verse 7. He says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, e uh, I'm sorry, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of, are the abundance of His grace. You see, the riches of His grace have to do with all that's included in God's magnificent grace toward us today in this present dispensation. And so that grace is abundant. It's more than is needed. It covers all of man's sin. And that grace is, is presented to us through our apostle, the apostle Paul. The source of that grace is, 
obviously was the Lord Jesus Christ and God Almighty. God gave his son that we might be saved by his grace. And so that grace is abundant. Uh, Notice over in Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2 verse 4. The Bible says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now notice, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace, in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Now, you know, a lot of times people ask a question, and they always have these ideas or, or, or thoughts in their mind about what we're going to be doing throughout eternity. Uh, well, I can tell you a couple of things for sure, but I, I know a lot less about this uh, than, than I, I, the Bible has very little really to say about it. So there's more that I don't know about what we're going to be doing than I do know. But I do know this. We're going to be bringing glory to our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he's going to gather together all things in Christ. And the Bible says in the ages to come, he's going to show. He's going to make manifest. He's going to broadcast, if you will. He's going to show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Uh, I remember Brother Moore used to use the example all the time about being in heaven and how that John the Baptist perhaps would come over to the Lord Jesus Christ during eternity and say, Lord, show me this grace that you talked about. And all God would have to do was just present one of us and from this dispensation who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ because we are vessels that are fit for wrath, for destruction. That's what we deserve. And in, in deserving hell, deserving eternal wrath, and not getting that, but rather living in eternity with our Savior throughout ages to come, that will be a demonstration. The very fact that we're there will be a demonstration of God's grace. And not only His grace, but the riches of His grace. Because it is through the riches of His grace that we have salvation today. That we were even made a part of salvation. Of salvation. So, the grace of God... Paul said, hath appeared to all men. And the grace of God is an abundant grace. All things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound, what? To the glory of God. Thank God for his grace. I can't imagine why anybody today wants to deny the truth about the grace of God. And go back and try to embrace the law or embrace some religious doctrine or some doctrine of man rather than embracing the grace that God has given us. This abundant, ever abundant. The always, it's always abundant. Not only that, it is ever abounding. Uh, to abound is very similar to the word abundant. Abundant. Uh, it means to occur or to exist in great quantities. It means to, to be rich or well supplied. And so God's grace is an abundant grace, but it also is an abounding grace. Uh, notice with me, if you will, find my page here, uh, over in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, and notice over there in verse 20. In Romans chapter 5, get back there. In Romans 5, well, let's just start in 18. 
Therefore, well, up in verse 12, let me remind you what verse 12 says. Wherefore is by one man sin in the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now, down in verse 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Now notice verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. You see, when the law was given, what did that do? That focused on the failure of mankind and his ability uh, to live it, as people say. He said, the law entered that the offense might abound. When a person looks at their life and believes that there's something good or something righteous in them, all they have to do is go back and look at the law and the Bible says that the law is given that every mouth might be stopped and all the world become guilty before God. So when the law entered, it shined a light on man's sinfulness. It shined a light on man's nature. It shined a light on man's destiny upon trusting in the law. But notice what the rest of the verse says. The law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. What a glorious and wonderful scripture. What a glorious and wonderful thought that where sin abounded, and that's you and I, by one man sin entered the world, and sin has abounded throughout the ages. But when Christ went to that cross, and hung there on that cross, and died for our sins, that we might have be justified freely by His grace. Grace, from that time forward, from the time that Paul came forth preaching this doctrine of grace, the grace of God has abounded. It's been more than enough. Uh, over in Romans chapter 6, well, let's just read the verse, let's read on in Romans 5. Verse 20 again. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, today we're living under the reign of God's grace. Now, people don't subject themselves to it. But the, the grace of God, the law is not reigning today. The law was taken out of the way and nailed to the cross. Today, grace reigns. It's on the throne. So what does Paul say in Romans 6, 1? What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? You see, we don't have to continue in sin. If people think, well, the more we sin, the more grace abounds. No, you can't, you can't out-sin the grace of God. You can't make grace abound any more than it's always already abounding. This idea that you present the grace of God by living in uh, in sin is just a, a, a misnomer. What Paul is showing us in Romans chapter 6 is sin is no longer the issue. Sin was dealt with at the cross. Shall we continue in sin? Shall we continue acting like we're under sin? No, it was dealt with at the cross. It was forgiven. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Why, sin doesn't make grace abound. Think about this. No matter how bad people are, the grace of God can save them. No matter how good man is, which is not good at all, the grace of God can save them. And so when grace abounds, the the grace of God abounding has to do with us living in this present dispensation of the glorious, wonderful, precious grace of Almighty God, the abounding grace. Uh, Paul said there in Titus chapter 2, verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness that uh, we should live soberly and righteously in this present evil world. So the grace of God 
abounds. It has nothing to do with what we do in our flesh. We can't make it less abounding or more abounding by the way we... In other words, it's it's available to all men. And you see this abounding grace. If you go to Ephesians, the, the fact that the grace of God is abounding and abundant not only has to do with the amount of God's grace, but it also has to do with the fact that God has extended that grace to people that never expected it and that it was never foretold that it would be extended to. Uh, In Ephesians chapter 2, by the way, in Acts 13, Paul's first recorded message, he said, By this man, all men are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So when Paul's ministry began, what is different about Paul is that it includes all men. He starts, obviously, with going to the Jew first and those that are worshiping with the Jews and uh, so forth. But there are some people that he writes to later over in Ephesians. And these people he addresses as uh, ye who are sometimes afar off. Now notice what he says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Wherefore remember... Lord, don't forget about this, that ye, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision of the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now, I just suspect that there may be something that was going on there at Ephesus, and I don't know this, and this speculation may be totally wrong. But it, it uh, appears to me that there may have been a, uh, some division uh, between those who first trusted in Christ and the fact that they were in the covenants of promise, and they were calling people by name. That's what he says. He says, in time past, you were Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision flesh made by hands. It's no difference. It's no doubt that Paul is not simply addressing Jew and Gentile here. Paul is addressing those who first trusted in Christ and those who later trusted in Christ. And when he does that, he says to these Ephesians, he said, You were called uh, uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision flesh made by hands. So there was some name calling going on. The Jews no doubt may have thought, well, how is it you could have the same preeminence and, and position that we have? We were God's people. Whereas the Ephesians, who were idol worshiping Gentiles, they're now in the body of Christ, and it's possible that they were thinking, well, we are somewhat at a higher position than them because now we're God's people, and that may not have been going on at all, but I'm, I, 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 I see there's a possibility. So Paul says that at that time, verse 12, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. You see, the reason I said what I did, it's like Paul said, listen, you don't have anything to brag about. You don't have anything to boast in. The only thing you've got to boast in is the grace of Almighty God. For he just said up there in the earlier in the chapter, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So there's no right for the Jew to boast. There's no right for the Gentile to boast because it's all, we're all saved by the grace of Almighty God, the abundant, abounding grace of God. And he goes on to say, In Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. 
who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. I was asked one time when the middle wall partition was broken down, and, you know, people want to argue about all that kind of stuff. Well, come on, folks. Uh, the middle wall of partition was broken down between the two groups, those who first trusted in Christ, those who later trusted in Christ. So it was broken down whenever they trusted in Christ. Now, let's go on. The grace of God is an abounding, abundant grace. Not only that, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, that grace is a sufficient grace. Look over there in 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians 12. You know, sometimes we, we think about the grace of God and we kind of put it in a box and we, we think about it only in relation to our salvation. Well, you know, Paul wrote to the Colossians and he said, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. The grace of God that God extended toward us, God expects us to extend toward one another. And the grace of God that was extended toward us ought to have an effect on our relationships one with another, whether it be in the home, in the church, and even in society with other saints. Now, I know sometimes it's hard for people to get along with each other, but God expects us to demonstrate the same grace toward people that he demonstrated toward us. You see, God didn't extend his grace to us because we deserved it. He didn't extend his grace toward us even because we asked for it. He extended his grace to us 2,000 years ago when he died on that cross for our sins. And so he desires for us to extend that same grace toward individuals. The grace of God should have an impact not only on our eternal destiny, but on our daily walk. And that's what Paul is writing about in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Notice what he says there. Uh, first part's about him being caught up into heaven and so forth. And in verse 6 he says, For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear. Lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. You see, if anybody had a, a reason to be exalted in their own mind, it would have been Paul. After all, he was chosen to be the apostle of the Gentiles. And he says, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now, most of you have probably heard me say many times what I believe that thorn in the flesh is. Uh, all kind of different ideas about it. Some say it was a, some kind of physical impairment, uh, uh, eyesight, something like that. But I believe if you look back in chapter 11, verse 24, Paul says, Of the Jews, five times received I thirty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. And he goes all through there talking about all the things he was confronted with, physically speaking, the physical resistance. And that would certainly qualify as the messenger of Satan. And to buffet is to beat upon. And Paul was beat upon continually. And I believe if I was the Apostle Paul, uh, even if I had bad, bad eyesight or anything else, the one thing I would be beseeching the Lord for is for the beatings to stop, for the resistance to stop. And it never did stop. Paul was confronted with it throughout his ministry. But regardless of that, whatever it was, he says there in verse 8, For this thing, this thorn in the flesh, I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. 
Now, I can tell you, folks, that that verse was a great comfort to me the first time I ever saw it and understood that we were not operating under the promises of the kingdom program. We were not operating under knock, and it shall be open unto you. Seek, and ye shall find. We're not operating under the promise of Matthew chapter 18 that says, if any two agree on having one thing you'll and pray for it, you'll have it. Uh, I remember as a young man, I prayed for things over and over again, and I never saw them come to fruition. I remember us at a group at a church going and anointing one of uh, my Sunday school teacher who had cancer and uh, reading from James where the elders came together and anointed him with oil, and a few weeks later that man died. And all of that shook my confidence in the Word of God because I didn't realize about rightly divide. I didn't understand about rightly dividing the word of truth and how that it really answered all the questions and solved all the discrepancies. And so it was a great blessing to me when I saw that. And it's a great blessing to know that God is not obligated, as some say that he is, to answer our prayer. God says we ought to pray. People say, well, why pray in the dispensation of the grace of God? I'll tell you why. Because the Bible says pray without ceasing. Uh, and Paul tells us how we ought to pay, pray and what we ought to pray for. If you want to know how to pray, then you go through Paul's epistles and read every one of Paul's prayers. And you'll get a real good idea of what your prayers ought to be about. Paul never prayed about his physical needs. Paul Praise God for some people that met his physical needs. But Paul prayed for people that the eyes of their understanding might be open, and on and on it goes. Am I saying you shouldn't pray about physical needs? No. The Bible says pray about everything and everything. Uh, pray, pray about all things. And make your request known unto God. Uh, and he says, in doing so, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall be yours. So, we can pray and we can understand that God hears our prayer. But what we also must understand in this present dispensation is that God is not obligated to answer our prayer. God has not even promised us that he'll answer our prayer. But what he has promised us is that no matter what situation we find ourselves in this life, and I know that's easy to say when everything's going fairly good and you're healthy and you're able to pay the bills and I may have a different uh, outlook altogether and I may be bitter and so forth when, you know, the time comes when a, one of my family is sick unto death or whatever, but I still believe the verse that God's grace is sufficient. Whether I allow that to have rule in my heart and my life is up to me. But God's grace is sufficient. So the grace of God is an abounding grace. It's an abundant grace. And it's a sufficient grace. And not only that, go back to Ephesians chapter 1. We'll wrap this up in just a few minutes. In Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians 1, in verse 5, Paul says, Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved. I want to say to you that the grace of God is glorious. It's a glorious grace. And that glorious grace is made known through the glorious gospel. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, you know the passage I'm going to. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul refers to the gospel as the glorious gospel. Well, you know why it's glorious? Because it proclaims the glorious grace of God how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And he was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. 
Paul said in verse 3 of 2 Corinthians 4, If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So this grace of God is a glorious grace, and that glorious grace is presented through the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ given to and through the Apostle Paul. Uh, Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. So God, by his glorious grace, sent forth an apostle to preach a glorious gospel. And by that glorious gospel, there was a body formed that the Bible calls a glorious church. Look over in Ephesians chapter 6. In Ephesians, I don't think chapter 5 is where I want to go. Ephesians 5. Now, folks, I believe with all of my heart that the church started with the Apostle Paul. This idea of the church being in existence when Peter was there and there being a new man added to the church and all that kind of, that's just a bunch of nonsense. Uh, the church, which is his body, Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians 3, he says we're, uh, by the way, in Ephesians 1, he says that that church, uh, or the body, uh, well, let me just read it. Ephesians one twenty three, he has put all things under his feet, gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. The church is the body. The body is the church. And it started with the Apostle Paul. And the reason I know that is because Ephesians 3, 6 says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Nobody has ever gotten into the body of Christ without hearing the glorious gospel of of the Apostle Paul, including Cornelius, regardless of what anybody wants to say, think, or otherwise, that glorious gospel was not preached until it was preached by the Apostle Paul. Now, in Ephesians chapter 5, in verse 26, or, or verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Now notice, that he might present it to himself a glorious church. A glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And it being holy and without blemish has nothing to do with anything we do in our flesh. It has everything to do with what Christ did in our behalf when he died on the cross for our sins, justified us, sanctified us, made us righteous and accepted in the blood and redeemed by his blood. And today we are part of that glorious church. And thank God that glorious church is formed by the preaching of a glorious gospel. And one of these days, that church is going to be caught up at the glorious appearing. Look in Titus chapter 2. In Titus chapter 2, everything about the grace of God is glorious. Everything about the grace of God points to the fact that we couldn't do it ourselves. Everything about the grace of God shows man inadequacy, how rotten and no good and undeserving we are. And it shows us that without that without the grace of God we would have no hope. No hope whatsoever. Now, in Titus chapter 2 in Titus chapter 2 verse 11 for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Look down in verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing 
of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, that grace that God Almighty extended toward us is the grace whereby God was able to save men who were strangers and covenants of promise and without hope and without God in the world. Now, in closing, I want you to think about God's grace and what Paul said there when he said, if by grace it is no more of works. Folks, we're living in a dis- in a separate and distinct dispensation from anything that came before or anything that will come after. And every day of our life, we ought to thank God for His grace because it is the always abundant, ever abounding, totally sufficient, glorious grace of God. I thank God for His grace tonight because I know that if I got what I deserved, I'd be burning tonight in a devil's hell. And I thank God for His grace because He reached down from heaven's glory and made salvation available to people like you and me. And you know, understanding all that we have in Christ should motivate us and cause us to walk worthy of the vocation we've been called and open our mouths and make known the truth of this glorious grace of God. Thank God for His grace. Thank God for grace believers and grace preachers that stand for this message. And uh, we never get tired. We should never get tired of talking about God's wonderful grace. I appreciate you being with us.